So could you kind of show us each of the books that you have out so far? Sure, of course. Well, let me go in order so I can present them the best. And this was, this is my first one and I thought it was going to be my only one. <laughs> um, it's called, We Fought to Win, American World War II Veterans Share Their Stories. This is the same lady, by the way, who's on the front of the coloring book, the Women of World War II coloring book. Um, and this is World War II Legacies Book One. So this was going to be my only book. And then I was writing newspaper stories and, and interviewing more vets and putting their stories in the newspaper. And more people were asking me for a second book. So I decided, okay, well, I'll do two. This is my World War II Legacies book two. They did it for honor, uh, stories of American World War II veterans. And while this doesn't have pictures of their faces, these photos were from vets in the book. I think this is a B-29. Um, and the, uh, there was a crew member who's in the book. And then even on the back, I put items that they had showed me in there to... Um, just give more educational value because I'm all about, you can ask my kids anytime we went on vacation, we went somewhere educational. <laughs> this is book three. We gave our best American World War II veterans tell their stories. And this is a, a unique book because among the other stories, this is a man who was a Marine who served at Montford Point. And he was an African-American and they were um, separated for basic training. So he, he is considered a Montford Point Marine. And there, I don't know that there's even any left, but he, that was kind of rare. And they were at the beginning trained by white uh, drill instructors or DIs because they didn't have any African-American drill instructors. And then once they got some of them trained, they were rougher, according to this guy here, they were rougher on the African-American recruits than the white men had been, they said. And so, and he served in, um, he served in the Pacific. So I feel like this has just got so many great stories. And then there's more pictures on the back, another wasp here. And then I have book four, which just came out last year, 2020. Um, this is We Defended Freedom, Adventures of World War II Veterans. So this has got, coincidentally, not on purpose, a lot of Navy, a lot of Navy stories. You can see I've got one here, here, and down here. And then um, this man here is Herschel Woody Williams. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He was a Marine at Iwo Jima who earned the Medal of Honor. He is the last living World War II Medal of Honor recipient. And this guy is busy as a bee. He, I'm on Facebook with him and I just follow him basically because he travels the country. And he has established a foundation of, um, I think it's called Gold Star Family Monuments for people who have lost family members. So not just World War II. Um, so then I have my D-Day book, Soldiers, Sailors, and Airmen Tell About Normandy. And that's um, it's a very special book to me. And then the, that is part of the World War II Insiders book series. So it's where I took a specific battle during the war and pulled out the men I had interviewed who were part of that and told and meshed all that together. And this is book two in that series, The Battle of the Bulge, uh, stories from those who fought and survived. I have to look at the titles because I tend to get them mixed up. And then my POW book captured stories of American World War II prisoners of war. And then I've got one that's a little bit different, but this one is about people who were children during the war. Uh, I had been interviewing the vets and they all said, they would always say, oh, but I've got this friend who grew up in Poland and they now live, you know, around here. They came to the States afterwards. You ought to hear his story. And I was thinking, oh, I better get the vets done and then I'll interview these people. I started to realize, you know what, they're in their 80s. 
<laughs> start interviewing them as well. So this is called, it was our war II youth in the shadows of world war II. This man actually lives in Fort Wayne. He worked for the Belgian resistance. He, he grew up in Belgium as a teenager, by the way, um, these children here, these families lived in London and had to be evacuated with their, the children had to be evacuated during the German blitz of bombs. So it was like an orphan train situation. The kids were put on with their IDs around their necks and just sent into the countryside to find people to live with. And I'm thinking, oh, how did their parents do that? And then this gal here as a teenager was a Rosie the Riveter. So, and then more, more stories there on the back. You know, and that's one thing that I think we can, well, and maybe it's just me, but you, you get so focused on the soldiers and the mm-hmm. strategy that was going on. You forget about the peripheral, of what was going on and mm-hmm. just the, the, like, yeah, I mean, bless you for writing that book and sharing those stories, you know, cause that is part of it. This is the kind of book I would have loved to have read as a kid. In fact, there is one book in here, or one story in here where a man who, I think he was 10, was his mother was a widow. She had a baby. They had, I think, eight kids and they lived in, um, oh gosh, now I would have forgot it, but it was part of, it's part of Poland. I'd have to look that name up. I'll get it back to you. Uh, They lived between Poland and Russia. And one night in January of 1945, a Russian cannonball came through the side of their house. And they had to immediately leave. They, they became refugees at that minute. They had to just take all the food that they had and go on the road. Now, this was January of 45. So they just were traveling west to try to get away from the Russians. Um, and the Russians were very angry at the Germans for killing so many of their people. They just weren't caring, really, who was hurt. I can't, I'm not taking sides. I'm just saying that's the way it was. Um, So that story alone is worth the price of the book because it is harrowing. So, um, but there's others, Hungary, Australia, um, England. I have three stories of that, uh, those kids. So I I can't imagine. And these are real people. These are people I've interviewed. Wow. to put together a second book of those stories maybe next year. And then you were saying, so you have, and you have the coloring books. Do you? Yes. I hope to get a men of world war II coloring book together. I don't know that it's going to happen for this fall, but um, I do want to say I have not only the pictures and these were done by a professional, not by me, <laughs> but I did put some bio information in the back of the book for each of the women featured so that anybody, not just kids who are um, coloring in the book will realize these were real people. And by the way, I wanted to mention too, the women were not drafted. There was no draft for women. And I also like to point out to people, we haven't had a draft for decades. So all of our current military, I I feel pretty good in saying that, but especially the young ones, they enlisted, they volunteered. I mean, I know they're getting paid and all that, but they're volunteering to serve our country. I'm just floored by that. I mean, my son is in too, but I'm not thinking of just him. I'm thinking of all of them. And I am really amazed. Uh, Not every country can, can say that. Right. So I'm very proud. So we do have good role models, but, but, you know, this, these people, they came over to the United States determined to be good citizens, you know, and, and do as much as they could because most of them were sponsored either by colleges or churches, church organizations to, uh, to get here. So I think they've made our country good. (laughs) And then you said you had some middle school books out as well? I do. I do. I, I have, have written for traditional publishers to put those together. I'm not doing those so much anymore, but I absolutely want to put together a World War II series 
for middle school. I'm trying to d- decide on a certain topic. It would probably be a three book series. But if anybody does want to see what I write or even uh, read some of the stories, I do put them on my blog. And um, I think you'll be able to show my website. Is that right? Yeah. So it's, it's just my name, KayleenResearch.com. And I do try to blog regularly. Um, that's like every two weeks or so. Um, and I pretty much am focused on World War II because I, I love it so much. And that will give people a really good idea. I, I choose different branches or even the military holidays to talk about. And I also do have a uh, mailing list, an email newsletter that goes out. I would love to hear from people if they would like to sign up. So you can contact me through my website. My um, email address is on there. And you speak. You can. (laughs) I do. I do. Well, and of course, with COVID, it has made it a little tricky, but I've learned how to do Zoom. And so I have spoken to groups in uh, library systems, mostly in Cleveland, Ohio, and Virginia, Illinois, uh, of course, Indiana, several spots in Indiana. And, um, you know, just because the vets are, maybe you could say they're primarily from Indiana, that doesn't mean that their stories are just unique for the state, because these POW stories, my goodness, everybody could get inspired by what these men went through. So uh, I have had to focus on just this state just because of proximity with gas costs and all that. But yeah, so I've done in person. I've got a couple of in-person talks coming up, God willing that we won't get sick or anything. And then um, a couple of Zoom talks scheduled for this fall. Some years I've had as many as 30 talks, but about six weeks leading up to Veterans Day, which is November 11th. So it'll start anywhere like early October through November 11th. And then, um, and that's busy. That's busy. I'm kind of glad we, (laughs) I'm not that busy right now. But, you know, the more people I can tell about these men and women, the more I'm thrilled. Yes. And, and then have you done any other wars or do you plan on doing any books on other wars or yes we hope to i hope to write um a book about vietnam for those vets i think that i and i like i said i have interviewed some of them and i would and every vet signs off on their story by the way i always get their permission and i always give a complimentary copy of the books to the vets even if they have passed on and i have contact info for one of their children, I'll send them a copy so that they're aware. And, uh, and by the way, one of the talks that I do give is about our World War II tour of Europe. My husband and I did a 10-day group tour in 2017, and it was quite amazing. We went to France, Germany, Belgium, and Luxembourg. We saw we stood on Omaha beach and then uh, we were in Paris. Uh, We saw Patton's grave in Luxembourg. We stood in a foxhole used uh, by the soldiers in Bastogne, Belgium. And, uh, you know, this was like a dream come true. And I have given that talk virtual and in person to thousands of people at this point. So it was, very exciting. And I would do it all over again. We were exhausted (laughs) because our guide was like a drill instructor (laughs) and our schedule was like this, you know, but it was one of the greatest things we've ever done. And we're so glad we did it. But, you know, when you're over in your travels, I see there's a picture of you, you and your husband buy this gun. What is that? A gun emplacement. It is a few miles back from Omaha Beach. It is one of three gun emplacements that were built by the Germans to overlook the beach. I mean, it was a few miles back, but what they would have was a a radio courier closer to the beach 
so that if there was an invasion, they would be able to shoot at the incoming boats. So that day on June 6, 1944, and then the subsequent uh, weeks that the allies kept coming in, that radio would, a uh, courier would radio back the coordinates of where those ships were that were coming into the shore. And then the gun would swivel and then shoot at those um, boats. And I actually have a very vivid story that's in my D-Day book and book one, We Fought to Win, about a Navy corpsman, which is a medic, the Navy calls them corpsmen, who was riding on a ship. He was in the back and one of those shells came and hit the front of the boat and it was gone. And all those men, young boys, I call them, were gone. So he had to jump overboard. He had his pack of medical supplies on his back and swim toward the um, shells that were firing on him. Miraculously, in my opinion, he got to shore without being injured, but he had lost his pack. So he had to crawl around on his stomach to uh, get the supplies that every soldier carried a certain amount of morphine or other medical supplies in their pack. And he was getting the supplies um, in the packs of the dead soldiers that were lying on the beach to be able to help the wounded. So that's what those gun emplacements represented. They were um, very powerful and, you know, they've been there about 80 years and they still look pretty menacing and uh, they could shoot for several miles. But, and if I can give one more travel tip to anybody, if you want to go to someplace here in the States that is World War II related and you can't get any better, the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. I should be their ambassador because I give a talk. Whenever I give any talk, I tell people, go to this place. I've even mentioned it in my books. There's a picture even in my D-Day book. Um, And it is absolutely huge, fantastic new. Um, They just added a Hilton hotel to their complex. So you don't have to walk anywhere or take a taxi to get there or Uber. Um, And it was so fun. I've been there twice and we go for two days. We buy the two day pass because we read everything and we go to their events that they might have planned theirs too. So very educational and um, really, really cool. Very neat. It's the number one tourist attraction in New Orleans, not Bourbon Street. Thank you, God. <laughs> well, you can just see the passion that you have. You know, it's such it's so nice hearing you speak. You mm. you can just see it. And thank you for using the gifts that God gave you to share these stories so that people for generations to come can have access to this knowledge and the research that you have done and the time involved. And, um, you know, and you were saying, why, why do you do this? You were, you were telling me earlier. Oh, it's, uh, it's a passion because I really believe we need good role models today. We do have good role models, but sometimes we get really discouraged with the way our country is divided. And I told you earlier, I'm a little envious of how united the country was when the war was going on. I've heard that so many times people will say, uh, and even I'll talk to people who are at the home front, women who were working in the factories and or taking care of children while younger women were working. Um, They'll say, oh, didn't you know, everything we did was to end the war. You know, they were willing to give up their uh, meat and they were giving up sugar and so on to get through the war, to send that overseas to the soldiers. Um, And heck, we were feeding people around the world. You know, it wasn't even just Americans. So it was it's just inspiring. And I believe in writing that is fulfilling And I have done a lot of writing. I've been writing for 30 years, um, since 1990. And I've done chicken soup stories and the children's books and thousands of newspaper articles and magazines. And I still do some of those, but it's pretty much focused on military at this point. 
So I uh, feel like it's something that just really means a lot to me. I don't want to show my family how much it means to me because they're putting so much effort into it. Yeah. Well, thank you for your, your passion and, and shedding light on these stories and, and giving those veterans a voice, you know, oh. that they maybe didn't have before, you know, just because they weren't, you know, well known to the world. So in fact, for the most part, the men and women told me they had never told their story before. And I wish I would have started earlier, but I, I can only do what I did. You know, I gotten 260 stories that when, wouldn't have been told otherwise. So everybody, if everybody just did a, a part, you know, we'd um, be able to show our vets how much they mean to us. Everybody can help support honor flights by going when they come home from the airport. Ours had to cancel this year, unfortunately, which was too bad, but hopefully next year. Um, but we, I did write thank you notes to them because they still did a mail call package to each one of them. So, you know, that was something I could do. And um, everybody can think of something. I, the one side benefit to all of this is uh, becoming good friends with a lot of them. I still go to visit one man who's in my book one. <laughs> he said, I don't know why you want to keep coming to visit. And I said, oh, Jean, it's because you're so sweet. <laughs> so Aww. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you, Raina. I really do. Yes. Thank you so very much. And oh, you're welcome. And if you want to look at uh, Kayleen's books, you can go to her website. And um, I believe you said they're on Amazon as well. They are on Amazon. Yes, yes, yes. We can do signed copies from home if anybody wants to contact me through my website. Uh, there's the contact info on each page. Perfect. Again, thank you so much. Thanks for joining me today. And again, thanks for using your gifts. And if I can just say thanks to all the vets or their families watching this, I really appreciate what you've done for our country. Yes. Thank you all for your service, for sure. Yes. Yes. All right.